Hi, thanks for your interest in Sparse Lizard. I'm going to walk you through how to set up and run your first Sparse Lizard example. For that, go on sparselizard.org in the download section. There are two ways to use and run Sparse Lizard. You can either compile it yourself, following the steps detailed in the documentation, or you can use the pre-compiled static library here. Compiling Sparse Lizard has been successfully tested on Linux and Mac. This will give you a fast version of Sparse Lizard since it's compiled for your system. If you don't want to install things or you want to give a quick try to Sparse Lizard, then the pre-compiled static library is something for you. If you're using Windows, we recommend you install Linux in a virtual box. In this video, we'll use the pre-compiled static library. We'll download it. We'll also download JMesh to mesh and create the geometry and visualize the output files. Then we will compile the simulation code of Sparse Lizard. We will run it and we'll see how to visualize the output in JMesh. Let's go. So let's first start to download the static library. I'll take this link. You could take this link depending on your system. I'll download it to my document folder. All right. I'll also download Gmesh on this website. And I'm gonna take Gmesh3. I'll download it to my document folder as well. Now let's come back to Gmesh. Gmesh is a widely used open source finite element mesher. You can import complex geometries and create complex meshes with different element types. All this supported by Sparse Lizard. You have a lot of user implementation and user feedback online to help you design your geometry and mesh the geometry. Everything has been downloaded to the document folder and can now be extracted. So we'll take the binary of Gmesh3. All other files we don't need. And we'll put that binary in the extracted sparse lizard file. There we go. Now, in the extracted sparse lizard zip file, we can see the static library here with the header files associated and an example folder. In this example folder, you will find commented examples to guide you through and help you in your first steps in Sparse Lizard. To run an example, you can, for example, copy these files into this folder, compile it and run it and visualize the output files. In this video, we'll be interested in this geometry file, this mesh file, and this CPP simulation code. Let's first have a look at the geometry we're gonna use. Now, for that, let's open a terminal in the folder that was just downloaded. And let's run with the gmesh binary that was just downloaded. Let's run the disk.geo file. This is what you get. You get a very simple 3D geometry of a disk. Now what we're gonna simulate is the mechanical deflection of that disk when you apply a volume force pointing downwards in the minus set direction and when the disk is clamped at its face here around. So let's mesh this shape in 3D.
Now you have a lot of options in GMesh, like for example, you use curved elements to better interpolate the circle shape around without adding any more elements. Now this is supported by Sparse Lizard without any extra effort, but for this video let's stick to that very simple 3D mesh. Now we can refine that mesh by splitting it to add some more elements. And then we save it. Now it's interesting to have a look at the physical regions that were created. If we come back to that disk.go file, we can see two things. First you define the geometry and then you define the physical regions. Now the physical regions are the regions that will be used in the finite element simulation. There are three of interest here. Volume region 1, surface region 2, and surface region 3. So 1, 2, 3. These you can find again here in this visualization. If you go to Tools, Visibility, you will find the physical regions again. And you can visualize them. So if I pick volume 1, it's the whole volume. If I select surface 2, you will see it's the surface around the disk where it will be clamped. If I select surface 3, it's the top face of the disk where the mechanical deflection will be saved. So remember, physical regions 1, 2, 3. Now the mesh is saved and we can have a look at the main.cpp file that will be used in the simulation. Now this is the actual sparse lizard code. You can see there is a main part which you can rewrite the way you want but in all examples you will always find this structure. So there are some initializations and then there is a call to sparse lizard where things actually happen. This is what is of interest. And in this the whole simulation is performed. So this is about 10 lines of code that is very little and because it's only 10 lines of code we can go through each line right now. So the first line is just for convenience. So we don't want to remember the physical region numbers 1, 2, 3. We want to associate name to it. So this is what we do. Vol is the whole region, it's region 1, if you remember just before. Sur is the region around the disk where we will clamp the disk, it's region 2. And top is the top face, it's region 3. The region numbers, you have defined them in the .geo file. Now we have created the disk.mesh file when we save the mesh. And this we simply load it in the my mesh mesh object. Next step, we define field U, which is the mechanical deflection field. Field U is based on classical nodal shape functions, also called H1 shape functions. But unlike, for example, the pressure field or the electric potential fields that are scalars, here the mechanical deflection is a three component vector and with a component in the x, y and z direction. We therefore add x, y, z, and to d you would have written h1, x, y. Now there are more shape functions in sparse lizard, for example edge shape functions which are very useful for electromagnetic computation. All this is in the documentation. Next step, we set the order of interpolation of field u. You can choose any order in sparse lizard. There is no limitation and since sparse lizard uses hierarchical shape functions you can combine any order on any field in any region. So if I had multiple physical regions I could simply duplicate this line and then choose another interpolation order on another region. This is no problem. Now for this let's for example choose order 2. 
on the whole volume region of all. All right. This means on every hexahedra in the mesh, a polynomial of order two, to keep it simple, will be used to approximate the solution. Next step, we set the constraint. So we clamp the disk on the surface. This is the face around the disk. Now, if we don't specify the value of the constraints, it's zero by default to save some, some things to write. Now, if we wanted to put a value, then you can put any expression you want. This can include other fields or the x, y, z coordinate field. It's very general. Next step, well, we will solve a linear elasticity problem to simulate the mechanical deflection. So this is mechanical deflections, assuming very tiny deflections. And for that, you need to know Young's modulus E and Poisson's ratio nu. We can define a parameter for that. A parameter is something that is allowed to change its value from physical region to physical region. Now, in this case, we just have one physical region of interest, vol, the whole region, and Young's modulus will be put to the same value on the whole region. So there is no point to put a parameter here. A double value would have been enough. But just for the illustration, we'll use a parameter. How do you use the parameter? How do you set the parameter? Well, you put the parameter name, you put a straight bar, which means you will select the region, and the region is vol, and on the region vol, you set the parameter to 150 gigapascal. Now this here again is any expression you want. This means you can include any x, y, z coordinate field to take into account the dependency of Young's modulus on the coordinate, or you can take into account the temperature dependency or whatever you want. So for example, if your temperature field was capital T, you could use it just like that, for example. All right, next step, we define the formulation. The formulation object here, we call it elasticity. This will now be defined by adding terms, plus equal. So to the elasticity formulation, we will add terms to create the weak formulation of the linear elasticity, including the volume force. For that, this has to be understood as follows. The weak formulation will be the integral over the whole volume region of this term plus the integral over the whole volume of this term is equal to zero. Now this term is the predefined linear elasticity. You could write it yourself, but since it's very classical and used routinely, it's predefined. Now this requires arguments like DOFU, this is DOF is for degree of freedom, and so sparse desert will know that this is the unknown field. This is the test function field, this is Young's modulus, and this is Poisson's ratio. And with this, sparse desert will write you the equations you need for linear elasticity. Now you can use any physics you want, you have a lot of examples to use electromagnetic problem, magnetic problem, electric problem, fluid problem, mechanical problem, and then you would just have to adapt the equations. Please refer to the examples online for that. Now, you have a lot of options everywhere. For example, in this, if you don't provide E and U, but you instead provide an expression matrix that is Hooke's matrix, H, then sparse lizard will solve for a general anisotropic problem. It's as easy as that. Next term, the volume force. For that, you multiply the test function by a row call a row vector with only a non-zero 
term that is in the Z component. This creates your volume term, volume force acting in the minus Z direction. Now the values here are just for illustration. Elasticity dot generate will generate your finite element problem. So this will create the algebraic matrices A and right hand side vector B in the algebraic AX equal B problem. If you had a time dependent problem, it will also create the mass matrix and the damping matrix. Now with the matrix A and right hand side vector B, you can solve that with a solve. This will be solved in parallel, just like the assembly term. The assembly step here that will also be performed in parallel on all of your computing cores. Now, when, when you have solved it, you will get the x solution vector, which is here called solu after solving ax equal b. It's a vector object. Now, at this stage, field u is by default all zero. To update field u with the solution, of the problem, so with the, with the disk deflection, you have to use this line. So this line will transfer the data that is in vector solute on the whole region vol to field U. And after this line, U is updated and now contains the disk deflection. Last step. is to write the field U on some physical region, so the top region, to, field, to file U.pos. And since we have used order two interpolations for U, we can also use, to, you can write field U with an order two interpolation. Now, if you don't put this argument, it's one by default. You can write any expression you want to the file. Here, for example, we just write u magnified by a factor around 1 billion, just for illustration. Now, I hope this is now much clearer, and we can now compile this, run it, and visualize the u.pos file. To compile it, let's go back to sparsevisit.org, and let's copy this command, and paste it here. Now this will compile sparse lizard. It's done. We can now run sparse lizard by running this. So we run the binary that has just been created. Now in the mesh we chose, we have 2000 hexahedra with order two interpolations. Now it's worth noting that during the computation, at some points in the generation and resolution phase, all my cores are used. So there is parallel computation done. This is done and has created the u.pos file, which we can now visualize with gmesh. This is what you get. Now it's a deflection, so you see a vector. If you want to see the deflection in 3D, then you go, you double click, you go to view vector display, displacement, and you magnify it by a factor one here because we have already saved a field magnified by a factor one billion. There we go. Now here it seems to be a bit, a bit rough. But before that, let's remove the color. It seems to be a bit rough at first, especially with the color actually. And this can be smoothed out as follows. Because we have saved as an order two interpolation, there is more information than just that. And we can ask Gmesh to refine by interpolating. For that, you double click, you go to All View Options, General, Adapt Visualization Grid, 
you set the target visualization error to a minimum and you increase the maximum recursion level. And you will get a very nice and smooth deflection. Now this clearly corresponds to the deflection of the top face of the disc when you apply a volume force in the minus Z direction. Alright, now it's worth looking at the influence of the interpolation order. Because we used only 2000 hexahedra, but at order 2 we get a very accurate solution. So let's remember that 0.585 maximum deflection. And now, just for fun, let's use order 1 interpolations which is not recommended for mechanics because you need much more elements and much more computing time to get the same accuracy. But let's try it anyway. So we compile again this sparse lizard code. We run again the code. It's running much faster because it's no more order two interpolations. But now look at the deflection, the maximum is 0.48, which is at least 20% of the actual deflection. So clearly order 2 did the job, order 1 needs more elements. Now we can as a last step, put more elements in the mesh by refining once more. So we refine once more. There is no need to recompile here because the code has not changed. We just run the code again. And now the disk file this dot mesh file has 16,000 hexahedra, but it's using order one interpolations. Now this takes a bit of time, not too long, I hope. This is not the newest computer I got. There we go. And we can visualize the u.pos file that we get. Now this is really interesting because as you can see we're still between 5 to 10 percent of the actual deflection even though we have four times more elements than what we had at order 2. So at order 2 interpolation we got a very accurate solution believe me it is, it was really accurate. And then we move to order one, but we multiply it by four, the number of elements. Sorry, not by four, by eight. And we're still five to 10% of the actual solution. So this is a nice illustration, just for fun, of using high order interpolations. Now you could have used order three interpolations in sparse lizard. This is no problem. And you would have got an even more accurate solution with even less elements. But that's beyond the scope of this video. I hope you enjoyed the video and I thank you for using Sparse Lizard. If you have any question, please feel free to ask it on the forum online on sparselizard.org. Have fun!